It's my pleasure today to invite Stephen King to the Brain Forest Cafe, and I'm going to read a brief uh, biographical sketch. We've known each other a long time, and he's an ethnobotanist of the first water and a very good friend. So I'll give you a brief biographical sketch, and then we'll ask him to come on. Steve began learning about tropical ecosystems, indigenous and local people in 1974 at the age of 15 when he went to the real Polochic River area in Alta Verpaz, Guatemala as a volunteer paramedic with the NGO Amigos de los Americas, where he supported volunteer MDs and dentists and provided vaccines to youth in the nearby small mountainous villages. A few years later, he visited the village of Angoterra Sequoia indigenous people in Peru who lived near the Colombian and Ecuadorian border with a Spanish Jesuit missionary, Luis Uriarte. That initial visit left to, led Steve to living with the Angoterra Sequoia community on the Santa Maria River for nine months in 1978, where he lived with a family and studied the diet and medicine, medicinal plant use in this community of 35 people. Shortly after that field work, he met Tim Plowman at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. Tim sent him to visit Dr. Schultes at Harvard on his way back to the College of the Atlantic, where he was earning his BA in human ecology. After earning his degree, he spent a year traveling in Peru and Bolivia, working with friends and colleagues as an ethnobotanist for hire, looking at Andean tuber crops, returning to visit the Sequoia people and other wanderings. He was then accepted as the first fellowship student at the Institute of Economic Botany at the New York Botanical Garden, studying with Ian Prance, Mike Malik, and colleagues in the Institute of Economic Botany. He conducted fieldwork in the Andean and Amazon regions. He did his PhD research on Andean tuber crops complex. He then was hired by the National Academy of Sciences as part of the Board of Agriculture Committee on Managing Global Genetic Resources. He was then hired as the chief botanist for Latin America at the Nature Conservancy, but met Lisa Conte, who invited him to help start Shaman Pharmaceuticals, along with Dennis, Mike Tempesta, and others. 35 years later, he is the Chief of Sustainable Supply, Ethnobotanical Research, and Intellectual Property at Jaguar Health, where he is focusing on the integration of traditional ethnomedical knowledge and the development of novel therapeutics. He is focused on reciprocity with local collaborating communities and the conservation of biocultural diversity. Over 3.5 decades, he has dedicated himself to the sustainable harvest and management of the miraculous Quoton Lechleri tree, also known as the dragon's blood tree, found in the Amazonian rainforest. Steve's efforts have been cru crucial in developing Crofelomer from the tree into an innovative plant-based prescription medicine, which is the first FDA-approved oral botanical drug. He has also focused his research and collaborations with local and indigenous communities in various regions, including Africa and Southeast Asia, with a focus on the conservation of biocultural diversity. Most recently, he and many ethnobotanical colleagues who are, were scientific strategy team advisors to Shaman formed the Entheogen Therapeutics Initiative that has led to the formation of Magdalena Biosciences, a joint venture between Jaguar and the Entheogen Therapeutics Initiative and Filament Health in Vancouver, Canada. And I imagine we will be discussing that uh, during the podcast. So it's my great pleasure to in welcome Steve to the great Brain Forest Cafe. Welcome, Steve. 
Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you for reading all that. That was maybe too much. That's a long bio. You, you, <laughs> had, not, you know, you have a track record. I mean, yeah, yeah. you're one of the, I don't know if you qualify for the term elder yet, but you I never know. Right, right. So you and I have been around a while. True, but also you, you're gracious enough to read such a long bio. So I figured, oh, you'll read something like that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I didn't get it all perfect, but. Yes, you did. You know, so I have to. I have a disclosure I have to make at the beginning. I said the first thing I want to do, so I don't forget, is I want to explicitly thank you, Dennis, for helping start Shaman Pharmaceuticals because you helped it get started, you helped it get funded, you helped create it and drive it. And uh, I know you were doing some more amazing things, the Alaska Project, in little increments. But I want to really officially formally thank you because we've come a long, long way, and you were a catalyst to make that happen and you've helped us with the scientific strategy team from Magdalena. So I wanna I wanna thank you for that um, on the record. I also want us to disclose one more thing. I love the McKenna Academy. I love the, the mystery school. Um, I think it's fantastic. Um, obviously I'm I'm biased. I think there's not enough mystery schools. There was one in the United States called the Ninth Gate Mystery School. And there probably are other ones, but I know it sounds funny, but to me it's a mystery why there aren't more mystery schools. So we need more. And uh, that, that's my, my, and I also love the film Diagnosis. And I, I love that project in Iquitos. Um, I just, I, I can't tell you enough how much I think that's a, a fantastic pro program that you're trying to put together. And, and, and Juan Ruiz and the people in that film, the women, they, it was just wonderful. So that's my disclosure. I'm, I'm heavily biased. Well, you're a pretty good promoter of the Academy, Steve. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, you know, see, I'm, I'm serious. Yeah. No, I understand that, and, and it's all the more meaningful for that. You know, we do go back a long way. You know, uh, Shaman Pharmaceuticals was my first real job, actually, after, you know, after I finished my postdocs at Stanford. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you remember the history of it, but it was Mark Plotkin who introduced me to Lisa Conti. Okay, I didn't know that. At that time, I was finishing up my postdoc at Stanford, and and uh, Steve Peruka, who was my supervisor there, said, you know, I'm going to go work for Genentech. He was offered a big job at Genentech as a head of neurology, and he said, you've been here two years. You've got two more two-year postdocs behind you. Don't you think it's about time you got a real job? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, but I'm liking what I'm doing. You know, please. And, okay. So then at that time, you know, serendipitously, Lisa showed up and said, you know, we're looking for somebody to be uh, whatever the title was, a director of ethnopharmacology. And yep. so when I ended up at, at, at the time, because of my postdocs, I had all this uh, molecular pharmacology under my belt, all this receptor technology. I was pretty good at that. So we set up the receptor screening lab. That was basically my job. Yep. And, uh, you know, that the, the, it was kind of a sideshow for shaman. They weren't really focused on CNS. Right. Focused on the antiviral. And at that time, yep. Sangre de Grado or Sangre de Drago. I yeah. always called it Sangre de Grado because yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Other, but but that was that was the uh, at that time SP three hundred three and that was being uh, touted as an antiviral drug, I, which it turned I, out it wasn't so good, but it turned out it was very good for diarrheal uh, you know disorders, and so that's what it ended up getting approved for. Yeah, not not being so good at, at, at antiviral is probably because the the large structure, the 35 chiral centers, wasn't uh, didn't get into the bloodstream. So yeah, it's to, just not how bioavailable. Can you, how can you treat something in the lungs if it doesn't get there? So yeah, go, try right. something else. They said. And as it turned out, uh, in the development of the antidiarrheal corfrelimor, that was a plus. The fact that it was not absorbed. Right. And and as and, and as of course yeah. uh, the, the the traditional knowledge, the indigenous knowledge was they were using it also for diarrhea as well as flus and coughs and stuff. So that directed us to look at assays that might be related to uh, diarrhea and and that enteric diseases. So there you go, indigenous knowledge directed us both ways. Yeah, yeah. So what I you know, the the whole shaman pharmaceutical odyssey, the idea of a 
ethnobotanical driven drug discovery company was novel. I mean, it, it's something that was discussed. Shaman Pharmaceuticals was the first company that actually tried to do it. And they managed to develop one drug, you know, profilomer. I mean, I think you've since licensed other drugs, but you didn't actually go through the whole process of identifying these things and bringing in the ethnobotanical work and so on. It was a tremendous challenge. Mm -hmm. And Shaman Pharmaceuticals was an example of how you do this. It is possible to do this. And as you know, from Schulte's on, people have paid lip service to the immense discoveries to be made from biodiverse ecosystems for new medicines. I remember a paper that stuck in my mind for many years was Mike Malik's uh, 1995 paper, The Value of Undiscovered Pharmaceuticals in the Rainforest in Economic Botany. Very interesting paper, you know, basically trying to quantify an unknown to say, well, based on what we know, how many blockbuster billion dollar drugs are left to be discovered? And he came up with a figure of about 328. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, now, and those were 1995 dollars. So each one of those would be a trillion dollars now. But the thing is, Steve, and I think the thing that is probably, it's dismaying to me, and it may be to you, is that. Uh, shaman Pharmaceuticals set the example. They showed that they could do this. They showed that they could do it ethically, that they could give, uh, you know, give back to these communities. They were very uh, committed to reciprocity and mutual benefits and all that. Far as I can tell, the pharmaceutical industry is was indifferent then, and they're pretty much indifferent now. Do you think that's that's well, an accurate perception. You know, I think it, big pharma, absolutely. Um, uh, um, uh, there's the smaller biotechs. There's been more for people at the periphery, both sometimes in Europe, sometimes in Australia. Um, and there, there's a couple now that are they're focusing on indigenous knowledge and combining it with AI, as I think you're familiar. So there's a little bit of a, a rebirth, in my view, going on. Um, but but in terms of the large pharma grabbing onto it and saying, hey, let's, let's follow this approach, let's try and do this, I think you're correct. And as you know, about the time we started Shaman, Merck and all these guys were sort of winding down their natural products program. So they really haven't, there hasn't been a big pharma resurgence. That, that's absolutely true. And if you came up with something, they might license it. But as you know, they were worried about intellectual property, that kind of stuff. But I do want to mention just one thing, because um, what's amazing about this, and it, and it makes me think about the project and the ketose diagnosis in the ovarium, so this is one plant, signing the drug, or proton right? Well, at the moment, there's um there's 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 five products that have that are two of them have been approved, one for um chemotherapy induced diarrhea in dogs by the Center for Veterinary Medicine, same molecule, the one for HIV AIDS chronic diarrhea in humans, same molecule. Um right now we're waiting for the final results, hopefully the next one from a prophylactic phase three chemotherapy induced prevention diarrhea study. To, uh, for another indication, same molecule. We're also looking at um, SBS and MBID. Those are uh, short bowel syndrome and, uh, and uh, microvillus inclusion disease. Uh, those are sort of more orphan, smaller diseases, but very big problems for the people, the children that have them. And then we also have two products that are not pharma, that are that are um, one for dogs uh, called neonorm, pardon me, for calves, neonorm calf, and one for horses, neonorm <laughs> full. That's also from Croton Lectoray, slightly different, uh, you know, extract. And lastly, we got an IND open for treating cholera with that same extract. It's, it's not the same as Crotone, but also from Croton Lectoray. So what I'm, what I'm really sort of marveling at is here's one species that's pretty well known, as you know, um, from the pharmacopoeia of indigenous knowledge of the Amazon. And as there's two, or two, two approved and two non-pharma and three or four on, coming out, and that's just one. And, and, and so when you think about what's there, um, it's amazing that there hasn't been more focus by large pharma. And also the opportunity is still massive. And obviously that's not the reason only by any means to conserve and manage tropical forest or traditional indigenous knowledge. But we look at one species and look at this. So yeah, it's crazy. Right. 
And that reflects the fact that there are so many multiple applications, reflects what indigenous people have always known. Uh, Sarbi de Grotto is used for lots of things. Yeah. Like most of these medicines, you know, right. they, have, they are used for many different things. And, and the, the people that use them traditionally have a different perspective on illness, you know. Right. And, uh, and so they do come up with these multiple uses. And any one of these, depending, of course, on the activity and the, me and the mechanism and so on, but any one of these could potentially have multiple uses. Like, Absolutely. as you know, we're, we're, we, and I'm now, by the way, thank you for inviting me to be back on the scientific strategy team and the entheogen strategy team. I feel honored to be included in that. But, you know, we're having these conversations about coca, you know, and coca yeah. is this very stigmatized drug because of its association with cocaine, right. which is, as Wade Davis says, a shitty drug <laughs> in every way <laughs> with what it's done. Yeah. And But coca is a whole other thing. And coca is potentially has multiple uses. I mean, just for ADHD, for example, which yeah. I understand uh, Magdalena, that's one of the therapeutic targets that you're working with with filament to see if it's uh, applicable for for uh, ADHD and other cognitive deficits. But chances are it's going to have other uses too, maybe even, maybe even for dementias. Absolutely. Or me memory? No, absolutely. Could not agree more. Could not have, and it's so safe. It's so it's been used so long, eight thousand years by millions of people. It's it's as Wade says, it's night and day. One is a, a very bad drug. The other is, you know, it's kind of amazing. Is the and I actually love this. Probably the DEA recently reclassified coca, not the Schedule One, Schedule Two, but the way they, they describe it, they describe it now um, as cocaine is the traditional plant based drug, which is fascinating because you know, I mean, at least they're using traditional and plant. Instead of just saying, you know, a horrible, you know, uh, you know, it's addictive substance, or they're, they're acknowledging the fact that it's part of traditional medicine, which I'm, I was happy about. Yeah. So hopefully, that means there'll be a, a shift in the regulatory regulatory framework. Uh, I don't. I mean, I guess there is a still a whole illicit infrastructure of cocaine production and export and and illegal sales worldwide. But, I mean, does anybody hate cocaine? It seems to me I like it's very 1980s kind of thing. You know, it's so funny to because I have the same impression. I'm like, I haven't met anybody anywhere talking about it. So it must be, there's this huge demand still. It's going to Europe and all the United States. But I have the same question, like, who's doing this? Um, I, I, I don't get it, actually. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it has, it has absolutely no appeal. I've, you know, uh, it, it, it's just interesting that, you know, somehow that, it, it, you know, that, that illicit uh, global uh, infrastructure and industry continues. And of course, if they want to really solve the, quote, drug problem with respect to cocaine, you legalize it. You know, I mean, this, absolutely. This is and, a no-brainer, and, and, and or you create products, out. create coca products that take take it out from under the the, the illicit, you know, coca producers. There's still going to be cocaine, but you you give markets for these things that are helpful and healthy and and useful and and all that that Wade talks about. I mean, it makes total sense. You find a, a pathway that honors the mama coca, the sacred leaf of the Inca, and you and you get it into you know commerce and use. By the way, I, I asked you one question though. It seems like Canada is much more open to all this stuff. I mean, they, they'll give permits for importing these things. Why is that? And thank goodness for Canada. Do you have any idea? Well, good question. I, I just think that Canadians are more reasonable people in general. <laughs> you know, they they they, they uh, make decisions based on on science more than more than politics. I mean, Kane such a such a political football. You know, yeah. yeah. And, but maybe this is changing, but I think, you know, the DEA and these regulatory agencies have had as much incentive to make sure cocaine remains prohibited 
Yes. As as the drug cartels, they're actually That's... in partnership with the drug cartels in the sense that everybody is profiting yeah. with yeah. illegal. And if they made cocaine legal, it's not the value of the drug. The drug is not worth anything. It's right. the fact that it's prohibited. And that elevates yeah. the price in the global markets and and it keeps the DEA's budget going and keeps the, you know, so it's it's a it's a it's it's a shell game. It's it's a, uh, you know, I mean it's it's absurd. You know they could and in Colombia and places like this, you know they've woken up to this. You know a long time ago, but yet I don't know what the status of Plan Colombia is or whether they're still spreading uh, gly glyphosate over the coca fields is there efforts made to eradicate it not so much anymore or, or... I, I i you know to be honest i, I think not so much anymore is, is correct i think that 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 the, the drug war that part of it i think it's, it's been so pernicious the impact on people's environments and 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 and, and humans or whatever that, that they said they couldn't do it but i will say uh, one of wade's colleagues uh wade introduced me to one of his colleagues in colombia and colleague uh, david restrepo and there are indigenous people's companies that are marketing and selling coca products, mangbe and other things in Colombia, which is yeah. beautiful. I mean, it's it's that it's happening. It's it's it, it's the train is moving. There's no question about it. Um, obviously in Colombia, they're, they're they're trying to come to terms with how to how to manage it as a as a as a dietary supplement or not as a as a pharmaceutical. And of course in Peru, there's tons of products, you know, from cookies to drinks to this and that, as well as the traditional chewing of coca leaves. So um, they're, they're, these are not just ancient; they're they're current. They're being they're being uplisted in in the or countries of origin. Right, right, yeah. And when we do this Coco Forum later in the year, we definitely want to bring some people from from that sector in. They're yeah. showing that they're getting all sorts of beneficial products from Coca. Yeah. It's it's like cannabis in some ways. It's like right. a, these things a multi use multi-application uh drug and, and medicine and, and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be uh therapeutic but it can certainly be that yeah but it can also be recreational in the same sense that you know coffee and tea and that sort of thing are and well, uh i would love to have i'm not so good at chewing mamba mamba <laughs> it's got a you know, get in my nostrils and choke me to death. But I love <laughs> chewing gum, you know. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like lots of just lots of good work. Yeah. You know, one thing, I, the, 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 there was a symposium of coca in Bogota. I, I wasn't there. I'm not a symposium. It was, a, it was like a day-long festival. And there's all these chefs in Colombia that make all these different dishes with coca, from desserts to, you know, to fish toppings. I mean, it was really cool. I mean, like another whole application of the, the sacred plant for, for foods. Right, right. It is as much a food as it is a medicine, or even a spice kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, it's just one of these marvelous plants. What is it about humans that we have to prohibit the most useful plants? I mean, that's like, well, you know that that that's a good question. Um, but it made me think about. I think it was Adrian Forsyth, or maybe it was who who talked about how coffee actually colonized humans. That basically coffee has, you know, and so I'm starting to think like uh, that ayahuasca is doing that in its own way as well. Like humans, are, they're using it as a vehicle to spread the plant and its and its, and its virtues around the planet. And um, I kind of think that makes sense. Coca may be the next one that's going to help. It's been colonized in a bad way, the plant, by making that pure compound. But let the plant, you know, have its wonders be be part of the human human diet and human human health. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's essentially true of any plant that is valuable to humans. Like Michael Pollan talks about how corn has has yeah. created the the global international monoculture based yeah. cultural uh yeah. situation, which is not necessarily a good thing, but corn is adapted to it. You know, corn is perfect for for industrial monoculture. And uh uh, and that's kind of unfortunate in some ways, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do think that these plants, uh, you know, we form symbiotic relation. Any plant that we value for food, medicine, textiles, construction yeah. material, anything that we value plants for, 
that is a kind of a symbiosis. You yes. Know? And, uh, uh, and their mutual benefits for the species. Yes. The species just want to spread. They just want to grow. Their agenda is very simple, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Ours is more complicated, but if we can if we can form these alliances, you know, i have lately in my writings and and talkings, I've been thinking, I've been uh, suggesting the idea that we should try and bring forward the the notion that we have a right to symbiosis, you know, that and it's not a human, it goes beyond simply a human right. It's an organismic right. We should be able to form a beneficial relationship with any damn plant or fungus that we want to without interference. So the idea that we can arrogate ourselves and, and uh, uh, you know, take on the authority to decree that something like coca or opium or some of these plants, which are incredibly useful, benefit a decree that they should be eradicated from the face of the earth. What gives us the right to do that? You know, to say that. I, I, I love it. I mean, I know you, I, I listened to your wonderful podcast with Rebecca, where you did talk about she was incredible and her work's amazing and the conversation with them. But you mentioned symbi symbiosis as a core of the McKenna Academy. I think that's a great idea. It goes beyond the rights of nature, sort of the rights of, of everybody to be symbiotic, including the plants with humans. Yeah, it's it's the right of living things of organisms on this planet, and that should uh, that should supersede any you know national or international legal structures. I mean, it should just be articulated in the in the same way that's human rights, but it goes beyond human rights, you know. I like, and I like uh, it. well, hopefully, I... people will start to listen, you know, because I... this is and. I think if you can, uh, you know, if you can frame this idea and sort of propagate this idea, you know, the 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 crisis that we face in on the on the global level, the environmental crisis, the climate crisis, as we know, at the root, this comes to a profound it comes down to a profound estrangement from nature. Yes, yeah. and yeah. a complete misunderstanding of our relationship to nature and the notion that nature exists for us to dominate, to use, to exploit, to extract, you know, and ultimately to destroy, you know. Yeah. That's yeah. where that perspective leads you to in the end, rather than this understanding that we're we're just one species in the biosphere. We're the most problematic species at the moment, you know? Yeah, yeah. We, but we could turn that around if we would wake up, you know? If we... I completely agree. In fact, I, this takes it a semi tension on that, but I've been dying to do this. I got it. So I, I'm not, I know you know all about plant neurobiology and you've had amazing interfaces with plants and plant teachings. So there's, there's, you probably know this guy, Gustav Fechner, who came up with this thought that the plants have souls and plants have. Are, are, are sentient, have consciousness, which is a, a big topic, I realize. And then there's right. this Rachel Peterson who, who who runs the Thinking with Plants Fungi Initiative at the Center for Study of World Religions at Harvard. I'm just thinking, just putting that together, divinity, Harvard, plants, fungi. And then I, I heard a, a, a podcast just the other day of, of Gary Naban, who I adore, and he mentioned that um, that in South Korea and other parts of the world, uh, there's some people are so dissociated from nature. Sometimes they're committing suicide because they're on computers all the time. Maybe that's come out of the pandemic thing, and that they're making gardens for people in urban areas to go into to get relationship to plants. That it has a, a therapeutic, you know, like the like forest bathing and stuff like that. But you take it to another level. It's like we we plants can heal us from our own in nature. I mean, the, we we're, we're, we got not you, maybe not me, but so much of the of the world other than the people that live in indigenous, I mean, in tropical forest or, or, or natural places, they're dissociated, like you just said. They're dissociated from plants. They're dissociated from nature, the things that they can sort of open up their senses and, and, and help them heal just by being around plants, much less taking them as medicine. So I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's we the have, we have come to devalue nature, you know, yes. and, uh, and view it as... Number one, that we are not part of it. Number two, that its value to us is only economic. 
you know, yeah, 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 yeah. so much more than that. And I think, uh, honestly, Steve, I think this is a legacy of uh, Christianity in some ways because, you know, or, or the Judeo-Christian tradition because it's always taught that, you know, dominion over the world is is the Christian perspective. And that's, you know, there's a, uh, you know, an inbuilt into that perspective is that, you know, this world has no value because you're going to the next, you know, you're ah, in heaven. Yeah, yeah. But there's no incentive to appreciate and love this world because because it's evil, you know, it's the source yeah. of evil and we're, we're, we're headed toward, uh, you know, the kingdom of heaven. This is, uh, well, I mean, we could get off on that track, I yeah. suppose. But this is a good example of the inherent sort of, you know, toxicity of these religions, which I'm pretty much not down with. <laughs> not to mention what's done to human beings, all human beings. But I forgot to finish that first. So that that um, so I guess it's always Schlunger. She's a journalist writing about plants called the, the light eaters. And then Carl Safra, a famous ecologist, both of them quoted Tim Plowman when they were talking about se- uh, the plants have feelings, are they sentient? And and I, I love this quote from Tim. I, I and I've seen it now several places. That Tim said. Oh, well, plants eat light. Isn't that enough? Like, why do we have to even, uh, you know, ascribe sentiment to it? They're eating light. Like, that, that's like, right. I, love, I love that set for quote. Of course they do. And of course they have a consciousness. You know, yeah. I, I'm yeah. not a, pretty much a pan psychist. I think that, pan, that consciousness permeates not only the biosphere, but probably the most fundamental levels of existence. But the idea that, uh, you know, uh, in the first place, it's hard to define what consciousness is. I mean, you can yeah. bounce that around for a long time. But plants are sentient. Plants are conscious. You know, pretty much everything in the biosphere is conscious. I would even say that humans are conscious. But humans are, humans are a lot less, in some ways, uh, less appreciative of their consciousness because they assume we're the only ones that are conscious. But... Uh, right. You right. know, and then you can take uh, psychedelic and yes. find out, no, actually, <laughs> <laughs> these plants have a lot to teach. And, and, uh, yeah. and yes. you know, indigenous people have always regarded these things as plant teachers. And I yeah. think very apt. I think that's exactly what they do. And, you know, to bring that conversation back around, I think that, I think that psychedelics are one of the, major catalysts available to us to wake up to what we're doing to the planet. So many people come away from these profound psychedelic experiences, particularly if they are taken in nature, Mm -hmm. realize then the connections between us and all species and the interconnection, interdependence of life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so... Plants are a catalyst for waking up the monkeys. You know, I've seen <laughs> people talk about waking up the monkeys. My concern is, is it happening fast enough? enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love waking up the monkeys. You know, um, what's in, sort of encouraging to me is the, 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 the large interest of all kinds of people, all walks of life, who would like to experience psilocybin, would like to. So there's a, there's a real draw, widely, widely beyond the sort of the, 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 the subculture that, you know, in the 60s and 70s. So that that's a very encouraging. But as you said, is, it, is there time? Is there time to wake up enough of us? I mean, ayahuasca is a good example. You cannot grow or produce enough ayahuasca for a billion people, you know? Right. I mean, I mean that, that's the problem. There are constraints on, on the production. And yeah. then, of course, you can turn to the uh, to the synthetics, but it's not the same, you know, and it, it's very interesting the the so-called, I don't know if it's correct to call it a psychedelic renaissance, but certainly within the last few years, the world has become more aware of the potential benefits of psychedelics. And, uh, you know, it's often viewed in terms of therapeutics. These are medicines. Yeah, yeah. But that happens within a much larger context. You know, these are these are plant teachers. These are plant right. teachers that we have co-evolved with, 
if you believe the stone date theory, which I do because I'm one of the chief promulgators of it, probably for millions of years we've co-evolved with these things. And they have a lot to do with the emergence of consciousness, you know. Uh, I mean, maybe that's implausible, but but maybe not so much if you look at the paleo climatic data for North Africa 2.5 million years ago. There were cattle there. There were, you know, it was a humid tropical environment. We have fossil evidence for cattle and hominids. Must have had to be there. Yeah, and no, I, I imagine I watched... these curious hominids who were also hungry were probably munching all those things. As, as humans are wont to do when they're hungry, yeah. It's like, what, what does this yeah. do? Yeah, yeah. Watch what happens to somebody. You no, know, I, I agree with you, actually. And, you know, in the case of psilocybin, those can be produced in rather large, you know, quantity. There's not a real constraint. Obviously, the whole world's not good. But, but if people wanted to find their way to that, it, it's not as hard to do uh, in terms of production. I mean, even these, like Phil had been trying to make a standardized extract from the plant. I mean, that's, some people will be afraid to take sort of more, here, take the mushrooms, but I mean, there's there's more entry points. They'll be coming, I think, which is good for, for different levels of people of interest. Right, right. Yeah, psilocybin mushrooms are one of those where we don't really have to work, worry too much about supply because anybody could grow them with uh, a little bit of persistence. We should right. we should be propagating that knowledge. I mean, we are spreading that knowledge, and yeah. uh, and that. That is a good thing. Something yeah. like ayahuasca or iboga, and peyote, you know, these are much more challenging to develop sustainable sources for, you know. And, especially peyote, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially peyote. And, and, and even things like the uh, Sonoran toad, uh, you I, mentioned that uh, in the other podcast, you know, I mean, People have this, you know, there are actually better botanical sources of phybothox than the than the uh, anadinent or uh, the snuffs. Yeah, yeah. Very high in phybothox ETMT. You need to, you know, you don't need to get it from the toad. It's this old romantic macho thing, kind of. Yeah. I think the same thing ha it applies to the combo medicine, you know, uh -huh. which is yeah. another amphibian that is really endangered due to the uh, over exploitation for for combo it's it, you know uh, i mean you you probably in your work in around the ketos you've probably seen that and there's a, there's a now an international market for it yeah um i mean what's really scary about the that the toad too is that the, the the cartels in sonora have gotten gotten involved where you know, the collectors who were collecting it for the, the market, they know you have to know how to do it and stuff. And they moved in and said, you teach us how to do it and or you do it for us. And so just another way to make money, sort of perverting that whole thing. Once again, where you're, I mean, it's, it's not like coke and cocaine, but here you have external forces moving in to control it. And here right. you talk, there's right. other ways to do it, like we're all, and that's not big pharma, that's big drug companies. I mean, big drug dealers. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of drives me crazy. It makes me sad. Yeah. The, this this is the this is the thing that's it's sad that uh, I guess the profit motive is you know yeah. always with us or at least in a capitalistic framework it's always with us so yeah. you know uh, like you know good science has led to the re sort of rediscovery of the benefits of psychedelics and then hey. big pharma. And that the venture capital community and all that has yeah. lost no time moving in on it and trying yeah. to control it. Sure. Now people, you know, some companies are even working on uh, uh, developing derivatives that are non psychedelic psychedelics. That right, we had. We <laughs> have. So the psychedelic experience is being, uh, you know, categorized as an adverse side effect. Yeah, no, I don't get that one. Engineer that out of the molecule because <laughs> it's inconvenient, you know. I don't get that one at all. I mean, except uh, sometimes it's just for patents, right? Because they're, you know, the compound themselves, A, they want to control the synthesis, and B, they can't file patents if it's a naturally long. But yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I don't think, I think it's a non-starter. I don't think that you can develop 
a psychedelic, I mean, by definition, you can't separate it from the psychedelic experience. Yeah, yeah. That is the basis of the therapeutic reaction. Yeah. And the the experience is related and reflected on okay. in the neurobiological changes that take place in nah. cognitivity and that sort of thing. I don't think they happen in the absence of that. I mean I I, I, I be wrong. I'll be I've been wrong before, but I'm very skeptical. I, I, I am too. I am too. But um are you are you actually saying that the same compound in the toad five MBOD that's in the snuffs, the exact same compound? It's the same compound. Well, the snuffs, the anodonanther is a combination yeah. of uh, DMT, 5 methoxy DMT, will fault name. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there's little, relatively little DMT. It's mostly 5 methoxy and bufotinine. Okay, okay. And uh, you could make a concentrate from those seeds because it's extremely high, you know, right. in concentration that could be smoked like the yeah. toad venom and yeah. it would yeah. be, it would be the same experience basically well, that that um might be a a way to divert some of the intense pressure on the toads if people understood that because you can cultivate if people understood it people uh, you have to get the information out that's, yeah, yeah that's right i remember Andy. i saw, I saw andy's talk at the maps meeting in denver and he was talking i think it was that one talking he had a he lived at some he had a little place in a, in a canyon outside tucson and the toads would come and cover his pool like it's certain times of year you have to kick them out of the way. They were just everywhere, and it just kind of made me laugh thinking about you know somebody's homestead being overrun by the toads. I well, like if it. you have that kind of problem, then I guess you can. I guess you can uh, can harvest them, you know. But yeah, yeah. in the but that, 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 desert, that, I think they're under a lot of pressure. Yeah, because... no, that that's not the story today for sure. That's not a story for us today for sure. Nah. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, yes. So, what else? What else? Um, I, I am curious to ask you, so your view that the synthetic version of these things will not have the, the, the healing and or other benefits is based on the sort of the, the unique specific structure of the compound in the plant. I mean, if, they, if, you, if you made a synthetic psilocybin, I mean, no, I, I, I don't think that. I think you can you can use synthetic psilocybin therapeutically, you know, uh, and and people do, and and yeah. those synthetics I think are more appropriate for a structured like clinical situation, you know, and that's fine. They lack the whole cultural context that right. the natural psychedelics do. Right. And right. I think that's essentially, a, uh, that's an important part of using these. If you want to say, I don't I don't think we want to get to a point where you say, well, these things are approved for therapeutic uses. You have to go to a clinic and pay $30,000 right. in the psilocybin treatment. Yeah. But if you want to go into the woods and, and pick mushrooms and take those, that's illegal. You can't do that. That's not right. Not that's. You know, I think we should. I think we should encourage people to, uh, you know, we should acknowledge that there are specific therapeutic applications where you do need that clinical structure, and that's right. fine. But for for but most people use psychedelics. They they are not. They don't use them to treat mental right. disorders they use them as learning experiences right. you know they le use them to become better people yeah. you know yeah. as bob jesse said these are used for for the betterment of the wells yeah yeah you yeah know? and people should be encouraged to use psychedelics natural psychedelics for those purposes all this work on drug discovery developing you know, derivatives of psilocybin and these sorts of things for therapeutic uses. Let's face it, Steve, they're not necessarily better than what right. we have from nature, but Agreed. they are more patentable. And that's what right. they're doing this. They're trying to develop these derivatives because they can yeah. patent them. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, it's hard to imagine how we could can take a molecule like psilocybin and improve on it. I mean, right. it has Agreed. all the characteristics you need. You don't yeah. need a synthetic derivative, and yet, and I'm I'm a complete total 
a proponent and advocate of the natural, like what Philem is doing, growing them and making a standardized extract from the plant, not from a synthetic. I completely agree with you. Way, way better. And I think a lot of people prefer that. Um, and it's funny, the, the juxtaposition you mentioned between a clinical therapeutic application and all this furious uh, activity versus human beings everywhere learning and, and experimenting and you know growing outside of that realm um, is uh, sort of like two two currents going different directions, but with a somewhat similar goal. I don't know. It's been fascinating to watch. For me, what's really blows my mind when I think back in the 90s, you know, there was this guy, uh, Lord Miller, who filed a patent on a variety of ayahuasca. And everybody went nuts. Fast forward 30 years, and now- I you know, remember him well. <laughs> yeah, but you, can go, you can go to, you can participate in ayahuasca ceremony in most major cities in North America and Europe almost any night of the week. I mean, it's so ubiquitous, which is not bad at all. It's good. It's good. But I, I always marvel at the, the juxtaposition. People are, are making money. Some people are, you know, as you know, I keep those in Ecuador, Brazil. There's there's good places to go. There's ones that are not sort of more exploitative. So it's fascinating to me the the flow of how it's how it's all gone. Because if you talked about, you know, um, I don't know, setting up uh, access to ayahuasca for, for profit at, at, at clinics or, or with these these centers. Some people would have been really upset 30 years ago, and now it's much more like, oh, this is this is acceptable and good and helpful in many cases. So it's just been amazing to watch. Yeah, I think I mean I I've, I've come to have a different perspective on uh, so-called uh, ayahuasca tourism and similar things. I mean, I used to organize ayahuasca retreats. I still do. I haven't exactly stopped, but I've I've come to think that what we really need to do. You know, ayahuasca tourism is a mini double-edged sword in the sense yeah. it puts pressure on the source, on the supply. It, it, in some ways, it disrupts these communities. It doesn't benefit them. Right. You know, one or two superstar curanderos in the community, they make lots of money. Everybody right. else is left behind. Uh -huh. I, what I have been saying in my talks and so on, we got to find, rather than people going to South America for the medicine, let's find a legal way to bring the medicine, right. North America and Europe, bring the medicine, work with indigenous people, develop sustainable supply infrastructures, you know, so that they can then produce it and export it. Yeah. And it can be lightly regulated. It should be yeah. prohibited, but lightly regulated for purity and quality. And let them supply it to these retreat centers, community-based retreat centers in North America and Europe. You know, so that yeah. then they get the benefit. They produce the medicine. Their shamans can come up and and you know uh, facilitate sessions or teach people how to do it. Uh, but they are not impacting. They're not disrupting the communities. It's more of a a mutual benefit. The yeah. The, the ayahuasca tourism uh, structure still in some ways is very exploitative. You know, most of the street centers, they're not run by indigenous people. They're run by right. gringos right. Who, who employ indigenous people, and that's great. But right. the indigenous people should be doing it. The community should be doing it. And yeah. uh, if there's a way that could be found, I think if, like, uh, you know, in a better world, 20 years from now, well, 20 years from now, who knows? <laughs> there may not be any Amazon left in 20 years, the way things are going, but let's let's not go there. But, let, right. but 20 years from now, if every, every community had essentially a holistic therapy center in which psychedelics were on the menu, you know, but maybe a, another range of therapeutic... Uh, practices were involved. You could go for a weekend, do a little yoga, take psychedelics, bring the kids, hang out, you know. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine what that would do for community solidarity, for family dynamics, for, yeah, for people's health, for people's yeah. you know, nutritional choices? It, it would fit very well into that. It's a, I mean, it's kind of happening at a real na na nascent level now, right? And you can go to some of these places in North America that offer some of those kind of things, but it's it's very, uh, I mean, not even legal in some cases, and, and it's it's, uh, it's 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 very expensive too, which just kind of makes me sad. It's like you said, I wouldn't, I don't like to think of 
access to this uh, ability to evolve and grow be limited to only to those who can pony up a whole bunch of money. Yeah, and and if they could come out of the shadows, if they did not have to operate, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the underground, it would be much healthier for everyone. And it reminds me, are you going to interview Rachel Harris because this book's coming in the sacred? That is a this is a really wonderful book. It's a you know this is a, a CD, but um, oh yeah, okay. She talks about all those underground teachers and how important their knowledge is, and that they're they're, they're they're at risk legally when they help people, and yet they have tremendous experience. They're sort of like a bridge between indigenous, you know, cultures and people that want to experience these things. Um, and and I, I think those people need to be made legal and given the ability to do their thing without yeah. the threat of any, you know. Right. I mean, it, it's it's it should be knowledge that is recognized and honored and and allowed in a community. It's kind of like the the knowledge of midwives or the knowledge of herbalists. Yeah. You know, it's always yeah. been marginalized and in some ways looked down upon. And yet, you know, if there were highly trained herbalists were more widespread and so on, that would take tremendous pressures off the 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 medical system, you know, because people could turn to they don't have to go to doctors and pay thousands of dollars for treatment. There's often an herbalist who you know who yeah. could recommend some plants that uh, yeah. you know have the therapeutic effect, and uh, and it's it's just much more human, you know, yeah. much more beneficial. I mean, I, I feel like we're going there with the legislation that are being trying to enact in various places around the U.S. and perhaps Europe. I'm not as familiar. That I think that's very promising. That that, that, yeah, that I, I agree. I think. Maybe the the decrim movement is healthy, yeah. But the decrim movement also has to be cautious and thoughtful about how it does how yeah. it works. Because, for example, the decrim movement, in my opinion, should just, as a matter of ethics, say, peyote is off limits. Right. You know, we're right. not gonna we're not gonna exploit leave I... to the indigenous people. It's their thing. There's not enough. There are better, there are not better, but alternative psychedelics. So we'll leave it alone. We won't alter it. But mushrooms, there's no problem with supply, and they're safe, and uh, they can be, and and they can people can be encouraged to to grow them. That's the thing. This is the knowledge that can be easily transmitted. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's community wisdom, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I've heard recently about end of life uh, positive experiences. When and you think about it, this culture, at least in America, death, dying. You know, we're not very good at that. We're so suppressed. It's a terrible thing. And yet, people are have such anxiety and so such such issues at the, at that phase of their of their life. And to have something that would sort of provide that that um, sort of re reorientation toward that passage um, and create a sense of awe about the, the passage. What a what a beautiful thing. That that is, and and, and it should yeah. be. A... This is one of those things where these community centers could really could really shine, and this is happening in Canada. There are actually places huh. that are cool. uh, Theracil and other uh, organizations. A lot of what they do is facilitate uh, dying with uh, fantastic with psilocybin therapy. So need but... to propagate that model, and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, we could go on and on, Steve, but I guess we better wrap it up here. We've just over an hour, so it's been good. Well, thank you. I want, I want to just also compliment you uh, uh, on how you are cultivating the younger generation of ethnobotanists. I think it's beautiful. Uh, the Michael Coe and, and, and Rebecca, I mean, this, you're, you're, you're helping sort of, uh, what's the right word, mentor in a beautiful way. Uh, as you said, we're kind of getting old. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, good on you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Michael Coe is a wonderful young man. He just got a real job. He's got a tenure-track position at the University of Texas. Wow. In ethnobiology, and he's going to start that uh, this fall. And wow. I'm so happy because I had, for a long time, I wanted to be able to bring him on to the academy as a paid yeah. Oh, you know, director of ethnobiology. Oh. We never got the money, but he went ahead and founded 
a, a position that he can that he can make a career out of, and it's great. And I should mention, uh, we he developed and taught for us uh, a beautiful long course in ethnobotany, uh, which we taught a few years ago in uh, with collaboration with the Organization for Tropical Studies. Mm -hmm. We've repurposed that. And uh, we've created an online version of that, and we're just about to offer it. In fact, I'll give you uh, access credentials to it so you can at least need people to look it over and, and uh, essentially beta test it. I'd Thank love you. you to take a take a glance at it and the uh, honor. Would be give honor. us our feedback. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. We're going Thank... to bring that forward. And that, uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in that. Uh, you know, people can't get this kind of information, and uh, academics are, for inexplicable reasons, shutting down their ethnobotany courses, like the University of Hawaii. I mean, I'm just gobsmacked. Mm -hmm. Of all places in the in the U.S., why would they shut down ethnobotany? It seems, just seems, well, very short sighted. Is yep. what it seems. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank My you. Friend, I will. I'll Thanks. record this. I'll get it all worked out, and I'll let you know when we're going to drop it. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank very, you. Very much appreciate your sharing your wisdom on us on the Brain Forest Cafe. My pleasure. Thank uh, you. All right.